Welcome to the Nerve Surgeon Channel. This is part three of a three-part lecture series talking about the nerve gap. And for this talk, we'll be concentrating on the management of mixed and motor nerve gap injuries with some case-based discussions. So the first case to present is an iatrogenous injury affecting the radial nerve just distal to the elbow. The patient had tennis elbow. This was treated with uh, an endoscopic debridement and release and the patient presented with absent function in the posterior interosseous nerve, absent sensation in the superficial radial nerve, as well as pain. Surgical exploration identified that there was a neuroma in continuity of the superficial radial nerve with a transection injury just distal to this neuroma affecting the posterior interosseous nerve. You can see in the right hand image that the proximal red sloop is around the superficial radial nerve and the posterior interosseous nerve as they are combined just before they branch distally. The neuroma is in the superficial radial nerve and the two yellow sloops are in the superficial radial nerve and in the ECRB branch which is arising from it. The posterior interosseous nerve takeoff is not visible in this view but this video now demonstrates that the posterior interosseous nerve in the red sloop is sectioned with a hole or a rent in the volar capsule and the capitellum is seen inside. And this is where a shaver has come up through the front of the elbow joint and damaged the radial nerve and posterior interosseous nerve lying anterolaterally in the volar aspect of the forearm. Different reconstructive strategies can be employed. The superficial radial nerve can be sacrificed and used to reconstruct as autologous graft, the motor component, which is the posterior interosseous nerve, and then the sensory components can be treated with reconstruction with allograft. There's the option to use sural nerve to produce cable grafting for both of these combined trunks. There's the option to just undertake a functional transfer using tendon transfers with FCR tendon transfer into the digital extensors and palmaris longus into the thumb. The treatment option selected was a grafting, and in this case, allograft was used. The strategy for this was because of a patient's desire to maintain independent finger function and unwillingness to have a general anaesthetic, nor have a sen second sensory deficit uh, from harvest of another autologous nerve. As a result of this, two step neurorophies were performed. Allograft was placed between the two damaged segments of nerve, one in the superficial radial nerve and one in the posterior interosseous nerve. The proximal neuroma had been resected and the two fascicle bundles identified, one obviously motor and one sensory, from the anatomical orientation. The ECRB branch was transferred to the distal end of the posterior interosseous nerve reconstruction, as it was felt there'd be sufficient motor axons as there was no reconstruction of the supinator branches, and trying to affect motor recovery from the mixed proximal stump that was feeding the superficial radial nerve and ECRB branch would have been a challenge. The area was sealed with tissue fibrin glue and you can see from this image that the site of the injury and reconstruction would normally result in about six months with an autologous graft be before active finger extension was regained. In this particular case it took significantly longer and almost 11 months although the patient went on to get excellent strength 18 months with independent function within the fingers, even able to maintain extension of the fingers with independent function with the wrist extended. It must be noted that when a tendon transfer is used, the tendon transfer crosses the dorsum of the wrist and can restrict wrist flexion and full independent function of the fingers is not gained, although some independence is maintained through the use of the median and ulnar nerve innervated intrinsics, which extend the interphalangeal joints. So allograft has good evidence for use in digital nerves, emerging excellent evidence for use in main trunk sensory nerves, but more limited efficacy for motor and mixed nerves. So the gold standard would still remain autologous grafting, but in this case the use of an allograft was partly because of patient choice and unwillingness to have a donor site morbidity from autologous graft harvest. The next case illustrates what to do if you've had an allograft reconstruction that's failed. This patient had a penetrating wound just above the wrist following an altercation. 
the area was explored and it had been reconstructed using processed nerve allograft. However, by nine months the patient had no functional recovery in the hand. There was a static tenel sign at the site of the proximal neurography. There was no return of autonomic function in the hand, which normally predates useful sensory or motor renovation with large fibre regeneration. And the patient continued to have pain worse with finger extension and wrist extension. There was no useful functional recovery in the femur muscles. Following consent, under reasonable anaesthetic block, the area was explored and a dense area of scar was identified around the site of previous repair and a neuroma was found. Neurolysis of the neuroma was performed, identifying scar between the proximal and distal normal nerve with a neuroma visible just proximal to the junction with the allograft. The decision was made to proceed with resection and autograft reconstruction and the patient had conversion of their anaesthesia to a general anaesthesia to allow this. The nerve was trimmed back and it was gradually found that after removal of about one and a half centimetres proximally there was a good fascicular structure. In the top right you can see there's still a ground glass appearance with inadequate fascicle demonstration across the whole uh, cut end of the nerve. In the bottom left this shows a adequately debrided proximal nerve stump. The gap was just over six centimetres and several cables of autologous sural nerve were placed reversed into the gap. The idea of reversing these is to minimize the risk of axonal escape through the regenerating axons. Each of these nerve graft cables is sutured into place with 9 or 10 nylon under an operating microscope with two or three sutures at each end and then the whole area is supplemented with a tissial fibrin glue. It's possible to undertake piecemeal reconstruction of the nerve trying to fascicle match between the proximal and distal cut ends of the nerve. However, because of the gap size, usually with interfascicular branching, the two cut faces of the nerves do not resemble each other proximally and distally and some surgeons may prefer to make up a bundle of cables on the bench and then suture this into place as a whole. The tissue is fibrin glue which is used to augment the repair, providing extra strength and a barrier to scar, although it only stays around for a couple of weeks. Microsurgical background can be used to roll around the seal and the neurography site to produce a nice circumferential seal. So this talk illustrates that mixed and motor nerve gap management can be treated in a number of ways. It's possible to restore the nerve function using autologous graft. Allograft confers some advantages, though we believe that the regeneration is a little slower, and sometimes recovery may be incomplete, particularly if the nerve has been inadequately debrided, there are any technical issues, or if the graft fails to revascularize or repopulate with Schwann cells and regenerating axons. There are alternative methods of restoring function in paralysis that involve distal nerve transfer and tendon transfers, and these will be covered at other talks on this site. Many thanks for listening, and if you require any further information, please follow us or contact us through the Nerve Clinic or through the Nerve Surgeon website.